Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Foundations. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, do and observe. Foundations. Understanding the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. With Robbo Robinson and Mandy Warby. Have you ever heard the expression, do as I say, not as I do? We use it to describe someone who tries to instruct others on how they should behave, while they themselves do the opposite. In this program, we're going to look at a seemingly contradictory statement by Jesus that has left a lot of believers scratching their heads. I think because of the uh, the lack of cultural understanding about the day in which Jesus lived, or any of the, the Bible characters, because we don't know much about their particular culture or the environment, you can't help but come away scratching your head over some of the things people say. And when you read the Gospels, you realize that Jesus actually had a lot of encounters with the different religious leaders. But on one particular occasion, he was speaking to religious leaders who were actually very angry with him. Although that wasn't uncommon. <laughs> Not that it was a rare occurrence, no. But they also wanted to harm him. And he spoke of various different reasons of why they should actually believe him and his teachings the miracles and the works that he done. And finally, he talked about the testimony of Scripture. He gave them a lot of evidences to believe who he was. Yeah, that's right. Well, this is in uh, John 5. I'll read from verse 33. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from a man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he's testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You don't have his word abiding in you, for you don't believe him who he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you're unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. As you know, I have always loved this passage because it reveals to everyone that there are multiple tests of the validity and proof of Jesus' identity, his authority, and his equality with God. And I love this passage because it tells us that no matter where you look in Scripture, it's going to reveal Jesus Mm, Christ. Now, if you read something in the Old Covenant and you go, well, I can't see him there, It doesn't mean that he's not there. It's just that we haven't figured out where he is yet. But (laughs) every time you dig into the scripture, you go, oh, my goodness, this is pointing to Jesus. That's exactly what he was saying to Mm. the religious leaders. I guess it's also a very sad passage because while Jesus is straight and very direct and confronting, you also see his heart and his love for the rigid, proud religious leaders. He's actually telling them that he's explaining these things to them in detail because he wants them to be saved. It says that in that first verse. They just flatly refuse to accept the truth. It really is heartbreaking. It, it actually is. And he, he, like you said, he's saying, I'm telling you this. I want you to be saved. Mm. There's all these evidences and proofs of who I am, and you just won't yeah, see. You won't and yet you, it. you'd spend all your time studying these scriptures, but the scriptures are pointing to me mm. and, and all of the works that I do are proving it. Yeah. I mean, he called them blind guides. I mean, they really were mm. very, very much. I think almost to a point of self-delusion as well. One of the characteristics, though, of Jesus' ministry is that there is almost constant confrontations with the religious leaders of his day. They were always trying to pull the rug out from under his feet. They were always trying to trap him with Mm. what they thought were clever questions, and they failed every time. But also what most people are not aware is that there was two schools of rabbinic thinking during that Second Temple period from the first century before Jesus arrived and the first century after Jesus arrived. And they were known as the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. And they were like opposing schools of thought. So, you know, one was quite liberal, one was quite strict and rigid. They both agreed on the laws themselves, Mm -hmm. but they were polar opposites when it comes to how to live them or Mm. apply them. So there is a website called the Jewish Virtual Library, and it actually explains the view of these two particular schools of thought. The explanation comes from Rabbi 
Isaac Luria. Would you mind just reading that quote out? Yeah, so this says, The Ari believe that in our present reality, where divine commandments must be imposed upon an imperfect world, the rulings of the House of Hillel represent the ultimate in conformity to the divine will, while the rulings of the House of Shammai represent an ideal that is too lofty for our present state, which is why we perceive them as stricter and more confining and can only be realized on the conceptual level. Yeah, so they're basically saying one's quite liberal and easy, one's quite strict. And it's just too hard for us. So reaching a consensus between these particular groups is impossible. Mm. They're not going to be able to bridge the gap there now. And we've already covered the differences between, say, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I'm going to make an assumption. It's just an assumption. But I would go so far as to say the Sadducees were of the house of Hillel because they were a lot more liberal and that the Pharisees were of the house of Shammai, which was a lot more strict and Mm. rigid. Here's the thing, when it comes to both schools of thought within the religious structure of Judaism in Jesus' day, Jesus was very critical of them all. Mm. And in Matthew 23, there is a long dialogue and he is so descriptive. And can I say he was fairly brutal? Mm. He didn't pull any punches, did he? he? He really didn't. He was so confronting with them. And it was a blow. It was a real serious blow to their external presentation of their piety and and their their self-professed righteousness that in Jesus' mind, all their piety didn't mean deadly squat, mm, yeah, not to right. him. Well, let's run through some of the different things Jesus said. So this is Matthew 23, and we'll just pull out some bullet points yeah. uh, through this. So verse 13, he says they were hypocrites, shutting people out of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 14 says devourers of widows' houses, pretense of long-winded prayers. Then in verse 15, he calls them sons of hell, which is... What do you think he meant? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I mean, that's so blunt. Very direct. Verse 16, he called them blind guides, making people swear falsely. And then in verses 17 to 22, he says again, fools and blind men who twisted scripture. I mean, you're talking some very serious accusation there. Mm. And these were the teachers of the law, so they held high position. In verse 23, he says they were fastidious on minor details of the law, but had no compassion or care for the needs of others. In verse 27, he called them, this is brutal, he called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Now that is a monumental insult because Mm. remember, if they touched or went near anything dead, it would defile them and they'd be basically ostracized from society Mm -hmm. for, I think it was seven days after ritual cleansing. So that's a big deal. Verse 28 says they were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And verse 33 called them a brood of vipers and murderers who were destined for hell. Mm. That's really savage. So it kind of appears (laughs) Jesus was not a fan of the behavior or teachings of the religious elite of his day. But there is a verse, early, a couple of verses earlier in Matthew 23. I'm just going to read them. It's verses 1 to 3, the beginning of verse 3. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, do and observe. Mm. <laughs> but then he went on to say yeah, all those terrible things about right. them. That's a real conundrum, isn't it? it yeah, uh, it really sort is. Of like, why would he say that, but then say all these you know, very harsh things about them? And unfortunately, we don't have time to answer the question today, but we <laughs> will. Next time, we'll look at this and find out why Jesus would say that when he thinks so little of their teachings and their behavior. So that's what we're going to explore next time on Foundations. This has been Foundations, a look at the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. For study notes, resources and more, see vision.org.au slash foundations. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 